By now, we all know that Cyberpunk 2077 is a buggy mess that performs poorly on all platforms, except PCs so beefy they can only be powered by Donald Trump's ego. Despite this, and in what I can only see as a damning indictment on the state of video game criticism today, most reviewers still lavish the game with 9 or even 10 out of 10 scores and recommendations for you to buy it. If people are dumping praise on Cyberpunk now with the state it's in, it will presumably be God's gift to gaming once the worst of the bugs are patched out, right? Well, in my humble opinion, no, absolutely not. Cyberpunk 2077 has problems that go well beyond the bugs in poor performance. The problems I'm going to discuss in this video are not ones that can be solved with expensive rigs. I don't care what platform you played on, no PC changes the fundamental problems at the heart of Cyberpunk 2077. I shouldn't say this next bit because it's unprofessional and I hate drama stuff, but screw it. I don't think I'll be doing this YouTube thing much longer, so I'm going to let loose a bit and say what's been on my mind for a while. Many reviewers have done their audience a huge disservice by heaping praise on such an underwhelming game. I'm not just talking about the big publications that people love to hate on. YouTubers usually escape the blame, but they are a huge part of the problem here, with many of them just influencers masquerading as critics. Look, I get it, criticising a game on release is hard. People want to hear nice things about the game they pre-ordered two years ago on the back of some CGI footage, and they will lash out negatively if you don't justify their purchase and years of devoted fandom. Just look at the shocking and predictable outrage to one of the few slightly critical reviews that did come out on launch. It's pathetic, but critics owe it to everyone, from developers to their colleagues to their readers or viewers, to at least acknowledge a game's problems in their critiques. If those problems don't detract from their overall enjoyment, that's fine. We all love flawed games. Just please don't brush the problems under the rug in the process. In fact, I love it when reviews mention the flaws and explain why they don't bother the reviewer, or in some cases even enhance their enjoyment. Even though it looks like a dream job, I actually don't envy reviewers, especially those at media outlets. They are underpaid, overworked, and get an insane amount of childish abuse just for giving their opinion on a video game. They're accused of being paid off or a lot worse, when in fact your average reviewer has no direct contact with the publisher. All the while YouTubers are praised for being genuine when they are very much more incentivized to play nice to get early review copies for the views. And that's before you throw in the all expenses paid overseas trips that I've seen some of them accept and not so much as disclosed in their reviews. Working for a big gaming website is frankly a thankless task, which is why I am genuinely reluctant to say anything negative about the industry and have held off for years. But here we are. Another AAA game has just come out to near universal critical acclaim despite being broken beyond belief. This is not a new problem, the entire review industry is as broken as this game, and there are no signs it will be patched anytime soon. Cyberpunk 2077 has enough maximum or nearly maximum review scores for CDPR to release one of those images you always see that's full of high scores, and the big name YouTubers have given it strong recommendations. Full props here to ACG, by the way, who refused to play ball with CDPR and is taking his time to play and review the game with a critical eye, like everyone should be doing. We actually have very different tastes in games, but that's not relevant. A good review is a good review, and we need more people like him. Undeniably, Cyberpunk 2077 is broken, regardless of what PC you have. The situation with the console versions is dire, possibly lawsuit-worthy, and the people in positions of power should have put their foot down when CDPR refused to hand out console ports for review. And even besides those substantial issues, there are the shortcomings that I'm going to discuss in this video. Problems that clearly detract from the game and cannot be overcome by a powerful graphics card. I can't help but think, if Cyberpunk 2077 got all these amazing review scores in the state it's in now, what scores would it have got if it didn't have any of the aforementioned problems? What if it was bug-free, worked on every platform, and was effectively a masterpiece of game design that pushed the medium forward? There's simply nowhere left to go on the scale when you hand out 9 or even 10 out of 10 to every game that looks nice and lets you do shooty shooty bang bang action. We have to have higher standards, otherwise what is the point of reviews at all? And don't even get me started on some big name YouTubers who have built careers around telling their audience exactly what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. These critics, and I use that word very bloody loosely, focus far too much on creating flashy videos and writing prose that says nothing of value but sounds kind of fancy. It's like they write their scripts as a series of quotes to be included on marketing materials, which, come to think of it, they probably do. The fact that I saw more in-depth criticism of this game in random Reddit threads than in lengthy reviews says a lot about the state of video game criticism right now. Look, I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. Actually, screw it, I am angry. 
Consumers deserve better than critics who give every big release a pass because it looks nice and lets you shoot things. It's no wonder so many major games are released half finished when people are happy to sing their praises regardless. Fallout 4 came out in 2015. It was full of bugs and received glowing reviews. Five years later, here we are. In 2025, the same thing will happen again. Cyberpunk 2077's deeper problems, the ones that won't be fixed in a patch in a few weeks or months, are the shallow, empty and lifeless world, lackluster mission design, a messy loot system, terrible driving, a lack of customization, and the worst implementation of a wanted system I've ever seen. A review that doesn't mention at least some of these issues isn't a review, it's a puff piece. After completing Cyberpunk 2077, I'm convinced it's the absolute textbook example of feature creep and lack of focus. CDPR didn't know what it wanted to make, or rather it knew that it wanted to make all of the things. It wanted Cyberpunk 2077 to be a story-heavy RPG like The Witcher that was also an action-adventure open world in the style of, say, Grand Theft Auto, while also being a looter shooter with mission design like Deus Ex. CDPR kept adding features and never finished implementing any of the existing ones. I'm not going to discuss bugs or performance problems in this video at all. I'm not dismissing them, not by any stretch, I'm just going to assume you all know how rough this game is already. You should have known it sooner, but CDPR manipulated the review process to ensure people were kept in the dark as long as possible, and most YouTubers and those in charge at the big outlets went along with it because those early views are too precious to give up. As you can tell, this video is not the full critique or even review of Cyberpunk 2077 that regular viewers might have been expecting, and it will be spoiler free. On that note, if you're a patron of this channel, don't worry I won't be charging you this month. This sort of low effort content is not what you signed up for, and you shouldn't pay for it. I'm not going to criticise Cyberpunk 2077 for not living up to the hype or for not fulfilling vague marketing fluff. As a general rule, I recommend not treating subjective statements of quality from marketing teams as fact. I didn't have any particular expectations for Cyberpunk 2077. I saw elements of GTA, Deus Ex and The Witcher in the limited footage I did watch, and obviously I hoped it would be a good game, but I didn't know what we'd get. My opinions are not just a case of, oh well you expected X but got Y and that's why you think it's mediocre. The following opinions are based on the game put in front of me. Speaking of which, for full disclosure I received a free review copy of this game and about a month or so before release I was sent some random swag items like a t-shirt and some badges because I'm a GOG affiliate and some of that stuff was Cyberpunk 2077 related. I don't know the value but it was minimal. Cyberpunk 2077's biggest issue is undoubtedly the world design. I don't mean visuals obviously. If you have the kind of rigor Bitcoin miner would be jealous of, then yeah, you can make the world look stunning. However, no graphics card can change how lifeless Night City is, which is why I'm not prepared to give critics a pass just because they played on expensive PCs. It's hard to know where to start with this topic. Mainly it's just a bunch of little problems that add up to create a feeling of emptiness. The NPCs are lifeless, they just hang around and don't do much of, well, anything. Their very limited AI scripting is painfully obvious. They don't have routines, they have this one particular thing they do, like leaning on a wall. That's it. The drivers are particularly bad in this respect. I'm fairly sure the cars don't have any independent AI. They follow scripted paths and can't react to anything that makes them deviate from that path. If something gets in their way, they just stop and wait until the obstruction has gone. Sometimes they don't even move after the obstruction has gone. You get huge backlogs of cars because the one at the front doesn't know what to do. There's no honking of their horns either or anything like that, everyone just sits silently in their cars. People sure are patient in Night City. Even when NPCs do react to what's going on, it actually only serves to show up how limited the AI is. So for example NPCs will cower when there's a shootout nearby, but then they don't make any attempt to run and hide. They also cower when there's seemingly no reason to do so and will stay in that state seemingly forever. After going back to look at my footage, it appears that one of the triggers that will make the NPCs cower is protagonist V taking any damage. However, that leads to crazy situations like NPCs acting as if they're in the middle of a shootout just because V simply took some full damage. None of the NPCs say anything interesting to you. You can try to talk to them, but 90% of the time you'll get a one-line variation on fuck off. I saw an NPC comforting someone who was crying. I decided to check in on them to see what happened, and she commented on the weather. It's hot today. Even the major companion characters are limited and stuck on predetermined paths. Do you remember when The Witcher 3 came out and everyone praised NPCs for moving faster to match Geralt's speed? So if you ran, they ran to keep up with you. 
At first I treated this like a gesture of convenience, but now that it's become more commonplace, I realise how big a role it plays in making NPCs feel real. There's little that tears you out of the moment more than having an NPC who refuses to keep up with you and continues on their scripted path at a slow speed while still having a conversation with you. I found myself spending way more time than I wanted to waiting in lifts for NPCs to catch up. It's a ridiculous limitation from the very people who invented the improved system five years ago. In fact, there are so many of these slow walking sections that a part of me wonders whether it's to pad the game length a bit. That's clearly speculation of course, but it's weird that when I do try to run ahead of an NPC, the game actually forces me back to walking speed. I swear I must have spent an hour following Pan Am around at snail's pace. As an aside, you can skip conversations if you want and there's this cool fast forward effect that plays out instead of a jarring cut, it's actually pretty good. Speaking of poor AI though, the police in Cyberpunk are an absolute joke. There's a wanted system along the lines of what's in GTA, so if you kill civilians the police will issue a warrant on you. Unlike in GTA, the police immediately spawn next to you and start shooting before you've even had the chance to kick the corpse. Don't worry though because if you drive around a corner they will forget all about you. I'm not exaggerating here, the police cannot give chase in vehicles and they aren't exactly fast on foot. There are police drones that fly and yet cannot chase you. It's insane. I played the original GTA back in the late 90s and it was better than this. And yes, it is fair to compare Cyberpunk 2077 to GTA. Games do not exist in a vacuum and saying, well they weren't trying to make a game like GTA is not only untrue, it's irrelevant. While on the subject of this wanted system, I don't entirely understand what's illegal and what isn't in Night City. The game makes a big deal of how citizens are allowed to carry guns at all times because of the second amendment. And yet if you take your gun out you get a warning that you're doing something illegal. Maybe it's a concealed carry thing. You're usually allowed to shoot your gun in self-defense of course, but the game seems to judge what is legitimate self-defense not on the issue of are you being shot at, but rather where are you doing the shooting from. You can tell there are specific like gang zones on the map that you're allowed to shoot in, and if you stray from those areas during a hectic gunfight you're instantly breaking the law. Bizarrely I've broken the law while taking out gangs, specifically at the request of the police. Mind you none of these rules work with any consistency. I tested the system out by fighting a random gang and only two thirds of the time did the police issue a warrant and spawn out of nowhere to fight me. The police even start shooting at you just for looking at them. All the gangs are like this as well, if you stand slightly too close they get annoyed and just go on the attack for no reason. Oh and if you stand in a corner the police might not spawn at all and you can keep shooting and killing people with no consequence. I think the game is trying not to spawn them in your direct line of vision and as a result it has nowhere it can spawn them because you're looking at everything. Or maybe this is a bug because at other times the police are happy to materialise directly in front of you, it's hard to tell. The thing is there's an easy solution to all of this. If CDPR didn't want to implement a wanted level system, and I'd argue it clearly didn't based on how lacklustre the implementation is, it could have easily left it out. Why not just write something into the story that gives V some kind of police immunity where they look the other way? It would be quite in keeping with the cyberpunk theme for a start and it would also excuse the fact that V does jobs for the police. It could be set up as a you scratch my back I'll scratch yours kind of thing. It's not a perfect solution obviously but it has to be better than this. I'm also disappointed with how empty some of the main missions are and I strongly suspect many of them had cut content late in development. There's a mission where you hack into a computer or a power plant. There's a lot of build up to it including a long drive, much of which is without any conversation at all and you can't skip it, although I guess that could be a bug. On the way to the power plant you pull over and go through a tutorial on how to use the big turret to shoot three stationary objects. I assume things were about to get messy, right? We pulled into the power station, I manned the turret and shot three drones. That was it. There were no other enemies at all and no pressure or chance to fail while hacking the computer. The tension was completely artificial. As you leave you need to shoot a few more drones, although some of them are kind of invincible because they need to trigger a scripted scene. There just had to have been more to this mission at some point. You do get to use this gun again in a later optional mission, except hilariously when you're ambushed you have to get off this beefy turret and go and shoot the enemies on foot. To be clear I'm actually in favour of slow paced content where appropriate and I often prioritise story over gameplay, I mean, just look at the games I cover on this channel, I'm an RPG guy. In fact I favour slow paced stuff because I'm close to 40 and my brain works slower than a PS4 trying to process the next frame of Cyberpunk 2077. But there's slow paced and there's bizarrely empty. This game has a lot of the latter. Then there's the lack of emergent gameplay, or the lack of good emergent gameplay rather. 
As you explore, you stumble across random events, like citizens being robbed, and you can ignore them or get involved. That's all good in theory, however it compounds existing problems like a lack of NPC AI. If you do try to help, the NPCs just stand around waiting to be hit in the crossfire, and if by some miracle they do survive, they will probably continue to stand around afterwards. A couple thanked me for helping out, but most were just clueless. Also, the gangs often shoot at you if you get close or even just drive past. Now personally, if I was robbing someone, I probably wouldn't draw attention to myself by shooting at random cars. It's obvious what CD Projekt Red was going for with this, but the NPCs are way too dumb for this stuff to ever truly feel dynamic. One of these events spawned in around me while I was selling loot. I exited the terminal and was immediately killed because apparently a robbery was in progress and the gang thought it was a good idea to shoot at me even though I was minding my own business. As uneventful as these moments are, I still wouldn't mind them if they weren't sort of level gated. Early in the game I stopped quite often to deal with these situations as I saw them, and I couldn't believe how hard some of them were. My bullets barely scratched the enemies and I had to use lots of cheese tactics. I would often be killed with one shot and I couldn't understand what the hell was going on. Well it turns out even these little events that are happening out in the open have a level of sorts attached to them, and if you go into one where the danger level is described as very high, you're going to have your work cut out. So this means if you see someone being robbed, you first need to check the map to see what the recommended level is before getting out to help. I don't mind side quests being sort of quasi locked off in this way, but it's not an at all appropriate way to handle what is supposed to be random dynamic content. All it means is you'll go up against insane bullet sponges. On a more minor note, the world is just so stale and empty. There are loads of markets and shops, but not many you can interact with. Weirdly, there are market stalls that you can interact with as part of scripted sequences in missions, but then not outside of those moments. You can go into nightclubs, but you can't dance. There's no concept of drug use or addiction outside of the scripted bits, which actually would have been a great fit for a game like this. You can't play on the arcade machines or partake in little mini games, and there is certainly nothing like Gwent. The thing is, I often don't partake in all those side activities, and if I do it tends not to be for long, just a little bit here and there, but having them available makes such a huge difference to the experience, because it means the world is alive. At times, Cyberpunk 2077 feels a bit like a walking simulator, where everything looks pretty but you can't interact with anything. There aren't any proper animations for eating and drinking outside of the scripted moments during missions. V showers with her clothes on, and the less said about how she sleeps, the better. I've seen people describe the world of Night City as vibrant and immersive, but I just don't see it. How can you immerse yourself in a world that blocks your every attempt to interact with it? Sure it might be pretty if you play on ultra settings, but surely beauty is only skin deep, that's certainly the case here. Visuals are not everything. One of the most immersive worlds I've played in is that of Fallout New Vegas, and frankly it's butt ugly. I can only assume those people calling this immersive just mainline the game, and never made any effort to engage with the world. Night City is about as interactive as a painting. In open world games I want to feel like the world exists even when I'm not there. A good open world pulls this off. NPCs have just enough of a routine that if you use your imagination you can believe they have lives elsewhere when you're not around. You're just someone they see on the way home or while out for dinner. Never for one second did I feel that way about the NPCs in Night City. This world only exists to serve the player. And when you aren't there, neither is anyone else. Alright, I know that sounds a bit silly because that's how all games do it, but I want the game to trick me into thinking that's not the case. This one doesn't even try. You aren't a resident of Night City. Night City is just set dressing for some shooting and conversations. It reminds me a bit of the Truman Show at times, except that world was probably more convincing. Truman would have figured out Night City wasn't real before he hit puberty. You've probably heard the phrase wide as an ocean deep as a puddle. I'm tempted to use that phrase here, but honestly it would be insulting to puddles. Next on the chopping block is the loot system. At some point during development, CDPR added looter shooters to the list of things they wanted this game to be. Yeah, I don't love it. There's nothing inherently wrong with having a lot of loot available. Hell, The Witcher 3 had a lot of stuff to pick up and I didn't have a problem there. The key, as always, is in the implementation. With The Witcher 3 I focused on getting particular gear sets and generally didn't change swords all that often. In Cyberpunk I was practically changing guns mid-magazine they came so thick and fast. There's no chance to get attached to any of the weapons because you know a new one will be along soon. Now things get better near the end, some of the later weapons are so spectacular you will want to keep hold of them even if you get one with say a better DPS, but by then I think it's a bit too late. Just the act of collecting the loot is annoying because it's so damn fiddly to pick up. You often have to get in just the right position to grab it. After fights while talking to NPCs I'd often sort of go around picking up the loot while they natted on. Except if you crouch down to pick up the hard to grab loot, you also skip part of the conversation. 
By default, the skip button is linked to crouch and you can't actually set skip to a different button. And the notifications about the loot you're collecting pop up so slowly that on multiple occasions I saw new gun notifications for guns I'd actually already sold. On a more minor note, there is no concept of ownership, so you can take whatever you want and no one cares. I think that's another thing that makes the world feel lifeless. You also can't remove mods from guns, which I think is a bit silly because it's things like silencers and scopes. Dealing with all the loot you collect is a huge hassle. You can't mark them as junk and you have to sell items one by one. And when you do, your entire inventory refreshes, as does the merchant's inventory. This feels a bit like an online game that is having to ping the server each time you sell gear. Another major issue is the skill tree. This is perhaps more of a missed opportunity than an outright problem. There are five attributes, which I very much suspect were six at one point based on the menu. Within the attributes, you have separate skill trees for related abilities where you can spend perk points. There's no shortage of options. In total, you have 12 skill trees to play with. I actually found this quite overwhelming at first. I mean, there's simply so much to choose from and I had a lot of choice paralysis early on. By the end, I struggled to find interesting places to spend those perk points. It's all minor buffs to damage, not much that really changes your playstyle or opens up cool new options. There's an entire skill tree devoted to crafting, which on my playthrough at least seemed to be the most absolutely useless set of mechanics I've seen in the game for a long time. There's not even an attempt at encouraging the player to engage with it through a tutorial or side quest, it's just there. Now, I'm definitely a little bit bitter on this topic, because I made a complete mess of my build. I wanted to go the stealth route early on, as I tend to do. However, it became clear that there weren't many useful stealth skills beyond speeding up the crouching walk speed. I was determined to avoid combat, however that wasn't always possible, and so when I did find myself in fights I was basically useless. I started focusing on handguns, and they're alright, but with hindsight I would have dumped more points into weapons like assault rifles, because frankly they're just more fun to use. The cold blood skill tree looks like it could be insanely powerful, especially in the late game, so I would definitely put points there if I started again with a more action oriented approach. The cyber enhancement aspect is another feature that doesn't live up to its potential, overall it just feels like another skill tree. You should definitely install mods like the ability to use smart guns where the bullets will hone in on enemies, and the double jump could be useful, but the system as a whole definitely feels underwhelming and is easily ignored. Maybe that's partly because cyberware is incredibly expensive, which limits your opportunity to play around with the mods. When or if Cyberpunk 2077 gets fixed, it should also get a new game plus mode so you can finally use the more expensive upgrades. I didn't particularly enjoy the main gameplay loop during missions either. This is the most subjective criticism in the video and is definitely something reasonable minds can differ on, although there are some specific problems that can't be ignored. I want to be generous here because I mean, if we treat Cyberpunk 2077 as a story focused RPG, then the combat just needs to be functional enough not to detract from other RPG elements. That's the argument I used for The Witcher games. Unfortunately, I think this is another example where Cyberpunk 2077 suffers for trying to be too many things. In The Witcher, there was no stealth. You had a choice of fighting styles, but you were always going to be fighting. Cyberpunk 2077 wants to give you lots of options. It wants to be a stealth game with a breadth of an immersive sim, plus hacking combat abilities, and then it's all supposed to play out like a bullet sponge looter shooter when everything goes to hell. The combination simply doesn't work, and most paths end up being frustrating. To probably no one's surprise, I started missions quietly and tried to stay unseen for as long as possible. My early impressions of the stealth weren't great, not helped by enemies seeing through walls even when all the cameras have been deactivated, but it grew on me a bit. You're given a decent amount of options for how to get to your objective, with my preferred approach generally being to maybe climb or look for a way in via the roof. You can utilise other skills to say brute force your way through doors or hack locks, and of course you can just shoot your way in. I'm glad these options exist because they serve as a way to reward players for their build choices, but I should point out that they are implemented in the least imaginative way possible. Regular viewers will know this is a pet peeve of mine, but I hate it when games present options to get past obstacles and then place all those options right next to each other. So it's like this is the door you go through if you have a strong body stat, this is the one for players with technical ability, this is the one if you're going stealth. When they're all right next to each other there isn't much point in separating them, it's so surface level that it's not really a choice at all. As for the rest of the stealth, it's lots of turning off cameras, sneaking up on guys and hiding the bodies. Nothing special but nothing horrible either when it's working. The enemies are actually more alert than your average which adds a nice bit of challenge, although again the AI is a problem here. For example, even if their vision meter gets to within 0.1 seconds of being completely full, they don't get suspicious and investigate. Once the bar is 100% full, it's all out alert and chaos. At 99.9% .9 there isn't so much as a curious what's that noise. 
Some stealth skills don't seem to work, like the aerial takedowns, which I was never once able to trigger. That's either a bug or a skill that requires such a specific set of circumstances to use that is basically pointless. There's a tech skill that lets you blind enemies through their cyberware, and yet you still have to go to the effort of getting behind them to grab them if you want to take them down. Oh, and there's a terrible quote-unquote perk that lets you throw knives at enemies. I assume they would be a special type of throwing knife that acted like a consumer item, but no, you're throwing away actual valuable weapons. Then the gunplay comes in, and yeah, I don't like it. It's often too easy because the enemies are incredibly stupid, and when it is challenging, it doesn't feel like a fair challenge. Full disclosure, because I know not everyone will have these problems, but for me, the screen was way too messy during combat. There is so much visual noise on screen that I can't pick out the important information like where I'm being shot from. Once enemies start hacking you, it all goes to hell. It should be quite easy to spot the enemies doing the hacking because they're typically sat down behind cover and not moving, except that's what the other enemies do too a lot of the time. I'm not sure if it's a bug or deliberate, but enemies do seem to get a bit of stage fright. Another thing that ruined the experience but could be a bug is the hit detection. You miss a lot of shots that you should hit, but given how awkward the enemies move around, often like they're suffering from online lag, it could be something that will be fixed. However, I also wonder whether there's perhaps some deliberate RNG at work here to simulate RPG elements. I hope not, but it feels that way at times. I certainly never felt like I could trust a reticule which then made me very hesitant in combat all the time, and that's probably why I didn't like it. You can make the combat look great if you want to. Spice together some footage of slow motion slides, cool katana moves and bullets seeking out enemies behind cover, and I can't blame anyone for thinking it looks great. It just doesn't feel great. Those fancy montages don't show enemies standing around doing nothing, ignoring grenades being thrown at their feet, and effectively serving as target practice. There were some particularly egregious moments of this at the end of the game, and it really killed the momentum. I can't show you that because of spoilers, but yeah, it was really rough. And then worst of all, the enemies are bullet sponges. I'm not entirely against bullet sponges in games, I mean, there's a time and a place for them, and if you have a loot system, you're inevitably going to have enemies that can soak up bullets. But that's probably a reason why this game shouldn't have a loot system in the first place. Likewise, the melee combat can look cool at times, but there aren't enough animations tied to most of the melee weapons, which leaves it feeling like an afterthought as well. I found the bullet sponge approach particularly frustrating because it doesn't mix well with stealth. You're encouraged to shoot enemies from stealth through damage multipliers and silencers. There's an entire stealth skill tree, so it's definitely intended to be a valid gameplay approach. Problem is, if you don't kill the enemy in one shot, and you likely won't, they will immediately alert their mates, which completely negates the point of having a silencer in the first place. In the end, I turned down the difficulty from very hard to hard and then to medium because I got so fed up with blasting shotguns into people's faces only to see barely a scratch knocked off their health bar, before I then got down in one shot by an enemy I couldn't see. I usually find it more rewarding to play games like this on the higher difficulties, but this might be one of those cases where you should just lower the challenge and kind of embrace the madness. Run around and find the fun for yourself, don't rely on a game to do it for you. Most of the problems I've discussed so far will be hard to fix. They are core features of the game. The rest of this video contains issues that definitely can be fixed, I'm just not sure how long that will take, especially given that fixing all the bugs and performance problems will rightly be the priority. Driving is a major part of Cyberpunk 2077. It's your major mode of transportation and there's a decent collection of cars and bikes to own. It's a shame that neither driving nor car ownership is at all fun. Driving is especially bad on PC. Obviously this is one of those things that tends to be better with a controller anyway, but I usually get by with keyboard and mouse. I played Watch Dogs Legion recently and had no problems. Most modern games like this offer a sort of mouse-based steering assist to make the experience smoother than just the WASD keys allow. There's none of that here, which meant I was practically forced to pick up the controller for driving, lest it become a complete shit show. Actually, that's not quite true, because there is a special vehicle you can control for select missions that I won't spoil, which does have mouse support. Weird that most don't, though. Vehicle physics are also a shit show, although let's face it, that can at least be amusing. It certainly never did GTA 5 any harm. A minor but bizarre omission is that you can't do wheelies on bikes. As discussed, the NPC drivers are all on fixed routes, so they don't react to your own driving at all beyond a one-liner if you hit their car. So many reviews have talked about how immersive the world is while driving around, and this just couldn't be further from the truth. The second you break NPCs off their fixed routes, any pretense of immersion is destroyed. The lack of actual AI for cars might be why there's no automated driving option, which again is something that has been present in other similar games for years. This is another weird omission because there actually is a self-driving taxi service in the story and a major side quest. 
Buying and owning cars is a big part of the game and yet there is no garage in which to keep your collection, even though there are actual parking lots in the game. Speaking of which, buying cars is a chore. There's no car dealership to buy vehicles from, instead you're randomly contacted with deals on cars and those deals are added to your quest log. Except the quest log doesn't show you a picture of the car. You have to back out of your journal and find the message and the one that matches the entry in the journal, it's pretty weird. And then there's the mini-map. I'm not against mini-maps as such. I know there's a school of thought that decries all mini-maps as terrible with mar immersion complaints and all that. However, I think there's a time and a place for them. Hell, we're all used to looking at a second screen for directions while driving. I mean, it's not the best option though. Games like, again, Watch Dogs Legion dynamically display the route on the road itself, which I personally think is a much better approach because it lets you keep your eyes on the middle of the screen instead of in the top right hand corner. It can look a bit obnoxious and busy, but you can always turn it off and Cyberpunk crossed that line a long time ago anyway. The thing is, this approach would be a great fit for the world. There are actually a few sections of road with arrows guiding your way, like why not make a bigger deal of that and have directions appear dynamically on the road signs as you drive? It, it could be done in a really subtle but cool way I think. A straight up mini map is a little old school, but I could have lived with it if it worked properly, but it doesn't. The mini map is really zoomed in and it doesn't zoom out at all while driving, so you can be coasting along at 80 odd miles an hour and suddenly have to make a sharp turn out of nowhere. Even Google Maps has the functionality to zoom out as you speed up. Alright, next is the issue of customization, which I think perfectly illustrates how conflicted CDPR was on the type of game it was making. You play as a fixed protagonist, V, but you can change their gender, change their appearance, and slightly dictate their background. The character creator is fairly generous, although you can't change your body size. Once you're past that character creation screen, you can't so much as get a haircut. I find that absolutely staggering to be honest. Even Geralt could visit a barber. Thing is, you should probably get used to looking like crap, because you can't transmog any of your gear. At any given moment, V looks like she got dressed by covering her naked body in tar and running through Elton John's closet. Again, I can't wrap my head around what CDPR was thinking here. I mean, I'm not that bothered by how my characters look, but even I can't escape the fact that cosmetics form a big part of the experience for most players, even in first person games. Games like Apex Legends have an entire business model based on how the character you can't see looks to other people you don't know. CDPR might have been better off going with a fixed protagonist and doing away with the character creator entirely, because I think at least that way it would have led to less frustration. I mean, you knew what you were getting with Geralt. You can't do any car customization either. Again, this is a strange thing to leave out. Lots of the cars are cobbled together junk heaps, crying out for the personal touch that people in this world would clearly give them. Just some basic decals would be nice, maybe a paint job if you're feeling generous. V has an apartment of her own and yet she can't customise it at all. To me this is further evidence that CDPR didn't fully think through this loot thing. People love to display their favourite guns and outfits, and yet there is no way to do that here. There's even a room in V's apartment that acts and is called a stash, and it has room to display guns on the wall, and yet you can't actually display guns on the wall. Well, you can display very specific guns if you get them during the game, but you can't choose what you want to display. Oh, and by the way, nothing screams cyberpunk future more than having to check a physical PC to get your emails. In the last few years, huge strides have been made in accessibility in video games. Major releases in 2020, such as The Last of Us 2, included an abundance of accessibility options, including a speech option that reads out what you're doing as you play, so blind players can complete the game. Ubisoft games throw you straight into an accessibility menu with a screen reader on by default when you boot up the game for the first time. Cyberpunk offers very little in the way of accessibility beyond some colourblind options, which I've heard don't even work all that well because of the aforementioned clusterfuck that is the HUD. Mind you, given that the game was giving people seizures on release, there are bigger problems to deal with first. The default controls are also a mess, particularly on PC. Now many of these can be changed of course, but I do have to wonder what they were thinking with the default setup. Your dodge is activated with a double tap of the directional buttons and this is easily done by accident. It's particularly frustrating outside of combat and is one of the many things that freaks out nearby NPCs. Ugh. What Help should me! I do? Holding tab to scan and then trying to move around and press F to choose options from the list is awkward as hell. Caps lock will make this a toggle feature, although strangely there's no toggle aim option. Now I don't use that personally, but a lot of people do. The left alt button switches between weapons, but a double tap puts your weapons away, so don't press it too quickly. 
One and three navigate between menus and things like security cameras, while Q and E are barely used, which is especially egregious when you look at how the F key is used for everything, including a lot of moments where I think the game should have taken over with an in-engine cutscene. During these scripted moments you have to press F to sit down, F to stand up, F to lean against a rail, F to lean on a car, and literally, no word of a lie, you press F to pay respects. For some reason there is a button to accept phone calls, however even if you don't press it, the game automatically accepts the call anyway. Thankfully V will disconnect if she ends up in the middle of a gunfight. The default sensitivity on the controllers is terrible. Now I mainly use keyboard and mouse, but I did use the controller for driving at times and that meant occasionally I would get out of my car to do some shooting. It feels like the analog sticks are as sensitive as a mouse, except you obviously don't have the same level of control, and that was with aim assist on. There is nothing in the menus letting you change the quick save button, nor does it even tell you what it is. It's F5 by the way, but I don't think there is a quick load option at all. While on the topic, the autosave is terrible and won't even kick in after you've completed missions. Save often. The menus are just generally annoying to navigate. You can get directly into the map by pressing the M key, but you can't get out of it by pressing it again. Instead you have to press the escape key twice for some reason. Given how poor the performance is on most systems, a benchmarking feature would be appreciated. Like most people, I haven't been able to get hold of a 30 series card yet, so I'm still running my 1080. I spent way more time than I would like trying to get optimal performance and tried out a variety of settings. God only knows what it will look like by the time YouTube is chewed up and spat out. Obviously this video is focused on the negatives, but there's a lot to like as well. If this was a full critique, I'd spend a lot of time talking about the story, for example. CDPR does story and dialogue better than most developers. Now, I don't think this is their best work, but it is still better than most, which frankly says more about the quality of writing in the industry as a whole than it does this game. At the start, you choose one of three career paths, corporate, nomad, or street kid, and you get a different opening based on your choice. I hadn't paid much attention to the pre-release marketing, so I didn't know what to expect here. Well, it's not much. It's 30 minutes or so before you end up in exactly the same place, regardless of what route you went with. What I did like was the conversation options that pop up for the rest of the game. If V has a corporate background, she can use that knowledge and experience to bring up salient points when talking to other corporate types. Very occasionally, this changes the nature of the conversation. More often than not, you just get another line of dialogue. Still, I do think it helps add another layer to V and it reinforces the background you chose for them at the start. The main story is a lot more positive and heartwarming than I expected. I was worried the dialogue would be overly edgy, but by and large it's actually quite touching. CDPR has the best writers in the AAA business, just no doubt about it. Some of the Johnny Silverhand stuff is a bit naff, mind you. Keanu Reeves phones it in a bit and generally sounds like he doesn't have a clue what's going on. The character of Johnny Silverhand will definitely divide people. He's a complete arsehole but also entertaining and I liked the constant devil on my shoulder vibe he gave off. I also enjoyed how relatively down to earth and personal the story was. V has a chip in her head that's going to kill her, she wants the chip out, nice and simple. No end of the world stuff, which is fine by me. The ending was really good, with plenty of heartfelt moments and a nice epilogue. The voice acting was also solid, although occasionally I think the voice direction was a bit off. Some of the lines just don't quite fit the circumstances and it sounds jarring. Even though I liked the main story, I would be remiss not to mention what it doesn't do, and that's engage with any of the major cyberpunk themes that it instead opts to include as window dressing. I can't help but wonder whether CDPR actually wanted to make a cyberpunk game or whether it just wanted to benefit from the popularity of cyberpunk without engaging in any of its deeper ideas. Transhumanism is clearly a big part of this world given the prevalence of body modifications and yet the story isn't interested in any of that beyond those awful mix it up posters which are everywhere by the way. Someone is very proud of that poster. I certainly have feelings on this, along with the stereotypical groups like the Voodoo Boys, however your time would be much better spent reading pieces by those directly affected. I'll link to some in the description. The new Shadowrun trilogy and Deus Ex games do a much better job at telling cyberpunk stories, and I recommend you check them out if you haven't already. In true CD Projekt Red fashion, the side quests are an absolute highlight and probably the best part of the game. They generally flesh out characters you meet in the main story, and I typically forgot whether I was doing a side quest or a main quest because they blend together so well. These side quests include everything from romance to tracking down some rogue AI cars. You can easily spend as much time on the side quests as you do the main story, and my favourite moments were all optional. I recommend doing as many as possible. I won't spoil anything, but you can fail some of these side quests with disastrous and genuinely quite crushing consequences. Your completion of side quests also affects not only your ending, but your ending mission. 
There's a decent amount of variety here, and while given my feelings on the game as a whole, I certainly wouldn't recommend starting from scratch just to see the new endings, it is worth messing around with save files to see them all. There's no shortage of collectibles to pick up that would expand the world and help you understand how Night City got to be the way it is. As is often the case with this kind of material, the writing is a little dry, but still worth reading. On that note, the world of Cyberpunk book is good and contains some lovely artwork, and best of all you can enjoy it on technologies as old as paper. Night City's backstory is certainly worth exploring. Given that I ignored the marketing, I'm not sure what is considered a spoiler, so I'll play it safe and just say that you should make an effort to delve into the world when you get the chance. There are cool little details to uncover. Finally, I should add that the soundtrack is pretty damn good. Completely fits in with the setting and vibe of the world, and listening to the radio is about the only good reason to drive places instead of fast travelling. While I found the gameplay loop lacking, there is fun to be had if you're one of those people who's prepared to find the fun. The weapons in the second half of the game might be a bit overpowered, but they are undeniably entertaining to mess around with, so long as you gloss over the fact that the enemies are just standing there waiting to be hit. Alright, I think I'm done. This was a weird video. A combination of the poor state of this game and a bunch of reviews that glossed over all its problems just to throw another glowing recommendation to the latest visually attractive but shallow AAA game was just too much for me to bear. I should reiterate that you are perfectly entitled to enjoy the game as much as you like. We all enjoy games that have problems, and Cyberpunk 2077 has a lot going for it, including some great writing. All I ask is for reviewers to mention the problems in their reviews, even if that upsets people. Alright, now I'm done. I'll be putting the Patreon on pause for this month because this is a low effort video and not one anyone should be paying for. The next videos on the channel will be Dead Space 3 and Deus Ex Mankind Divided. After that, well let's see. There should be more videos in my series on the history of isometric CRPGs but the pace may slow down. You can still sign up on Patreon if you like, I'm never going to charge for a month that I don't put out videos. Okay, until next time, cheers.